Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we are on stream number two uh, on my channel on Twitch. Uh, the show is Breaking Absolutes. Uh, quick reminder, part of the goal of this particular show is to talk to artists who uh, I believe are really working um, and, and creating work that has an, an emotional core, has something really important to say, uh, in in that it could appeal to a broad set of people and not just those who are already fans of the band or fans of the genre. Um, and I, I want to kind of tear down those stereotypes and and seek to uh, have this music um, explored and discovered uh, by those who've not yet heard it. And uh, today I have the honor of have a, having uh, Tuomas Holopainen from the band Nightwish. He is their uh, composer, founder, um, lyricist, and uh, keyboardist. Um, he's been nominated for some awards and we'll talk a, a little bit about that later. Uh, but Tuomas is a multi-creative uh, and one of the most genuine, um, caring, gracious people I've met. And I've met uh, my fair share of, of rock and roll artists. So um, without further ado, let me bring on uh, Tuomas and we'll start our conversation. Welcome. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Um, you're in Finland, so you're, it's much later for you. So I appreciate your time. Absolutely, no problem. Listen, um, I know that uh, you guys, let's just kind of make sure we say this uh, right up front, but, but uh, Nightwish, with all of the, the, the pandemic, everybody, all, bands just have not really been able to do live music. Um, and you, Nightwish has been preparing something really special that comes uh, towards the end of May. I know many of your fans are probably aware, but but let's just right from the beginning ask you to share a little bit about this special virtual event that you're planning. Yeah, it's going to happen during the last weekend of May, and it's definitely going to be the world first when it comes to virtual shows, how it's going to look, how you can interact with the band all that so the band is definitely really excited about that so i definitely um hope you all tune in then we actually just had the first band rehearsals about a week and a half ago started to put together the set list for the two shows and it was just brilliant to actually see the band for the first time in about 14 months yeah so yeah that's something that we have been focusing on for the past few months and uh, the material that I've seen so far looks just incredible. It, it really does. So I hope we can make it work together with the band because I know the music is there. The band is really excited to actually do something after all these months to get together yeah. and play, especially some songs from the new album that have never been played before and will have their world premiere during these virtual shows. But the surroundings and the amount of details in this virtual tavern, as we call it, is something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, the, is the tavern what we've seen called the Islander Arms? Yes. Okay. They, I, I think it was just yesterday, a really uh, a cool cinematic was released that shows this sort of um, bird's eye view kind of resolving down to the entryway. Uh, it was a wonderful teaser. For the show. And there will be another one coming in about three weeks, which shows a little bit more, but you want to keep the secrets, you know, yeah, until yeah. they want to be revealed. So not yeah. too much yet. Okay. <laughs> well, that's exciting. Th this will be the, um, and we're going to spend a healthy amount of time talking about human nature, but this will really be the first time you guys will perform that music. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. That's great. Um, I mean, we're not going to perform the whole album. It's not going to be a human nature concert. So okay. just some selected songs from the album, a, a little bit split between those two shows. Okay. Will you, and if this is too detailed, you can tell me, but will you uh, reach back into all of the Nightwish catalog for this? Or will it be more focused on recent records? It will be more focused on the recent records, but there will be some older stuff as well. Okay. And naturally, uh, since the departure of Margo, we had to again adjust the set list a little bit because there are just some songs that are so focused on his vocals, especially that uh, 
for example, the song Endlessness from Human Nature, that was something that we were planning on performing live, but uh, it's never going to happen now because it's so prolific to my point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and the if I re remember correctly from my reading, um, the the announcement of the new bass player will be f at the virtual show. Is that accurate? That's correct. Yes. Okay. A few so Kevin, hours before the first show. That's a big reveal moment in the history of Nightwish. That'll be fun. <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's talk about um, human nature. Uh, I spent some time over the past week listening to this double album. Uh, I, I like to listen to records front to back. I don't like to skip around. Um, Wonderful. And I, I, my question, and I've a, I ask most artists this, because uh, it's kind of a throwback to, I believe, the way albums were created, usually back in the, the, the time of vinyl and CD. But um, it appears to me that there's, there's real thoughtfulness in the way you, you put the, the, the track listing linearly together. Um, is that, it, is that a, an accurate statement? Was there, is it, thought, is it deliberate? It's extremely important to find the correct order for the songs. Even if it's not a thematic album, you still need to think of the dramatics and the listening experience as a whole. And like you, I love my music as a whole. I like to listen to albums from beginning to the end. And um, they just need to make sense. It needs to complete a certain journey. So okay. yes, to answer your question, we, we think about the order of the songs very carefully. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that um, I love your music. Uh, in, I mean, there's a whole sonic side to it, but um, a great deal of the way you seem to write is with a narrative sense. Um, and that, that I, I, can, I can acknowledge that could just be an Aurelian, you know, experience or reaction. Mm -hmm. But um, you do write music, especially the last couple of records that have very, very powerful, like you're not afraid to, to, to um, explore big themes, my friend. Uh, these, uh, these, <laughs> <laughs> these concepts that you um, are tackling are big ideas, really big ideas. Um, well, art, yeah, art is about being inspired by stuff and then, you know, channeling it out through your system, through this mortal body and yeah. make it your own. Music for me is above everything a personal journey. It helps me search what's inside and bring clarity to the occasional chaos within. Uh, it's also a way to communicate with the outside world in ways otherwise um, impossible. Yeah. Um, the... Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just one more thing. It's also like a way for me to pay back the world, all the fantastical things it has given to us, show gratitude and say thank you to the world, to the existence and to a whole bunch of people. It's yeah. easier. It's a really good way of doing that. And a good example of this is the last song of the Human Nature album. On the, yeah, on the, the orchestra. Human Fighter? Or on, on, okay, on the, on the uh, nature side. Yeah, all the works of nature, which are done the world. Yeah. That is a, one big thank you letter without any lyrics to yeah. existence and planet Earth. It's, um, it's gorgeous. And, and I'm just going I, to, I, one of the, the questions I wanted to ask, and not, maybe, maybe it's more of a comment, but um, the, we, this was, um, I, I think this took some boldness on your part to uh, release an entire record. In, this is a double album, an entire record of uh, orchestral music. Um, now your, your music has for the longest time had orchestral elements, of course, um, but, but you know, usually in the context of a, sort of a power metal. Um, and, and that's frankly, I think one of the, the things that gives it, its distinctiveness and, and probably um, resulted in so many bands trying to emulate the Nightwish sound, but this this second side was, I think, bold. It, um, putting this this artistic effort that had such, um, I think, a personal meaning, 
uh, as a, as this thank you for your fans to see. Mm -hmm. I'm interested what, um, what kind of reaction have you had to these, to the nature element of the release? Pretty mixed, I would say. Like many people say that it should have been like a solo thing. It's not truly really Nightwish because you can't hear any uh, guitars, bass, drums, not even actually keyboards that much there. But I just felt like this is the essence of what we are. And it was a piece of music that just had to come out. Yeah. And when I originally um, talked about this idea to the other band members, everybody was really excited about it. Yeah, we have never done this before. This is what it calls. This, it's a beautiful idea. And, you know, in music, there shouldn't be any egos right. involved. You know, you know, it's, it's not a Nightwish song because I don't get to play in it or any, <laughs> any of that nonsense. We make music for an album. We try to create a journey, an experience for the listener. And all the works of nature which adorn the world just perfectly complements the first nine songs of the album when you listen to the whole thing. I, I think so too. Um, I have a proclivity for um, classical music and orchestral music, but... Um, for me, it made perfect sense that, that it would have that sonic distinction. Um, and to be honest with you, and this <clears throat> this sounds uh, maybe like a highfalutin uh, statement, but there there are times when I think artists have to um, uh, and are all almost obligated to make artistic statements that they believe need to be said, regardless of whether or not they're going to be popular. Um, and absolutely like that. that's the very essence of art it's freedom it's uh you know like i said no ego involved in the process no calculation forget all the nonsense of formulas or preconceived norms music art is about purity and freedom yeah. and it should be the very essence that we experience um as human beings basically yeah well it's a it's um it's a beautiful it's a beautiful um expression of your or you know of your musical self and it was very clear both in the music and in the uh video content released with it um that it was this thank you and this love letter to nature and i want to talk more about that but um i want to i want to um make a, a mention back to this narrative idea. So interestingly to me, the past couple of records, ha they've had these, these, they've addressed these big thematic ideas and narratively, and I know he's, you're a fan of his, they remind me of Neil Gaiman. And they do because the, the, um, the way that they're, they're even lyrically that they're approached is archetypal. Uh, it, it's not centered on an individual's experience so much. Um, you know, as a, mm. a record, maybe like Operation Mind Crime or something like that. The, the, the story uh, motion is dealing with these big archetypes. I mean, when you have entire pieces of music called, called music, um, called the harvest, I mean, these are, it, it speaks to a larger ideology. And I, I, I love that kind of storytelling. I also love Neil Gaiman who's a, a favorite writer of mine, and he's known for telling story in this way. Um, and so with that as kind of a framework, I wanted to start, um, I wanted to ask you first, uh, you, made, you said once that this record was kind of a, the next step of exploration of themes begun in Endless Forms Most Beautiful. And I was hoping you could maybe just um, articulate a little bit about what you mean by that. First of all, Thank you for the compliment. Neil Gaiman is one of my favorites as well. And I actually never thought of it that way. But now when you as an author described it to me, it actually makes perfect sense. But it never occurred to me before. Um, the last two albums, Endless Forms and Human Nature, are the least personal albums that Nightwish has ever done. When you go back to albums like Dark Passion Play once, century child there are there are a lot of really really personal songs 
like excerpts from a diary of my life. What a dilemma. I mean, the most deeply personal and intimate secrets shared open wide for the whole world to see. But it just had to be done. But with the previous two albums, uh, we uh, hit these themes more broadly. And, you know, um, like you mentioned, music. It's about the entity of music descending on mankind some hundreds of thousands of years ago and presenting herself, you know, I'm here, you know, make good use of me. So that's not a personal narrative. That's just uh, a thought play of what might have happened. And now that you mentioned, yeah, it's a bit game manish approach. Yeah. No, the, the, um, the, the, the interesting things about uh, telling story, even musically with archetypes is they usually, they have a familiarity that uh, can have broad appeal. So, um, and then I want to get into the sonic nature, some of the choices you made, and let's just do that. Let's talk about uh, Harvest. The first half of that song is also, I think, a very bold artistic choice because it almost has a world music feel. The, the, the Nightwish sound, if you will, doesn't really enter into the song till like halfway through. So, you're this the and I don't know if this was instinctive or deliberate, but the way in which you chose to uh, begin and start to tell this story about the harvest and to, to musically represent it had hmm. had this kind of um, relationship with a, a music that that made sense for it. Is that I mean, am I making sense? Does that was that a, a deliberate choice or did that that just was that a a, a feeling that drove it? You are making perfect sense, but uh, I don't think we are being bold by doing these things. That's the thing that uh, you just said, and we hear quite often that what a bold move to do a song like this. I mean, we just listen to the story how she wants to be told. And this particular song, Harvest, told us that, you know, I want to be told like this. Started off like this, let Troy sing the piece. It's, uh, it's nothing like you want to uh, try to be original for originality's sake. You just be humble before the song and tell it as it wants to be told, as simple as this. Of course, uh, you never want to do the same album or even the same song twice. So you want to search some new territories and find some new ways of telling that particular story. So that's all, always refreshing for the listener and for us as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I think that your, I think your instincts are um, really good here, Thomas. Um, and, you know, and I don't know uh, your fan base and, and what their uh, expectations and reactions are, but um, as coming coming in into a listen of the album kind of cold, if you will, like I hadn't read any of the reviews, I hadn't uh, spoken to fans, I just got to experience the album for me, and there, I had actually had moments of chills where the, the music song, the harvest song, uh, uh, tribal, these songs, the way that the music expressed the ideas was really powerful, and I don't mean to just um, sit here to compliment you but I think you've achieved what you meant to achieve um, in doing this and so I wanted to commend you for it um, thank you it was a beautiful experience for me um, and I, um, let's keep talking about this you have a song I think it was the first um, um, song that was had a video release called noise and there's been a ton of commentary about this and I don't want to retread that ground I wanted to talk to you though about the video. Um, it's a very powerful video. And uh, I mean, it's fun. There's a lot of fun things going on in the video, but there's, there's a couple of images that are that st st stayed with me. One is there's a moment where you have, I don't know, must be a hundred uh, people in robes sitting in some kind of church or cathedral and uh, bent forward into their phones. And so there's this, uh, there's one read of that that suggests that people have have are almost 
almost um, worshiping this this little screen. It's become the sort of center of their life. Another of the images, just the second that I want to mention, is an image that shows a guy sort of plugged in. He's laying on a table, and behind him is the beauty of creation. There's the forest and the mountains. That was a very Matrix moment, uh, as though he, <laughs> yeah. his, ex- his experience was having to come through these ports and this headgear while the, the, the most beautiful thing that you could see was he, he wasn't seeing. It was next to him next to him and the the, those two images they are um very powerful images and i wondered are do you do you provide any input to how the song should be represented visually in this process or do you are you do you give license to the video creator to interpret what you mean we had a few discussions with the director of the video stobe harju and I just threw him some ideas. One of these was this uh, art gallery scene, because I've seen a photo of that in real life. It became a viral hit a few years ago. A bunch of these teenagers in an art gallery, and every single one of them was on their iPhones. And there was this beautiful, I think it was Rembrandt painting right next to them, and nobody was looking at that. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but... uh, I think many people watching this broadcast will know what I'm talking about. So that was the inspiration for that particular scene. And then there definitely needed to be uh, the old guy strapped in the helmet into the virtual world with a lot of babies around him. Mm -hmm. So these were just the ideas that I threw at the director and then he took it from there, so to say. And the message behind the video and the song shouldn't be unclear to anybody but i think we added just enough amount of humor in there to it not be preachy and i'm personally super proud of the result i think it looks amazing it's a bit funny Um, uh, it can be a bit distressing but i think in the end it's quite optimistic because it shows that the real world is still out there it's yeah. still out there. So get out and go in. Stop it being does. a tool of a tool. And also it doesn't it doesn't really criticize like smart devices in itself, because I think there are absolutely brilliant inventions which will help mankind tremendously. But we just need to keep them in leash. Yeah. And no, so I many agree. of us are not doing that. I noticed myself at some point that I'm spending half of my waking time looking at the screen yeah. okay ma- mainly i use it to read the news or play fantasy hockey or just harmless stuff like that but still it's far too much so now i have given myself some limits you know one hour yeah. before bed one hour after waking up don't touch the thing and use it for only when it's necessary it um it's really smart I, there's a there's a Doc, sort of a documentary um, called The Social Dilemma. Uh, I don't know if you've seen It's a lot of executives. I've wanted to see that. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I haven't seen it, but it's on my list. It's very good. I mean, um, you, one of its central messages is that big tech's whole business model is that the, you as the consumer are the commodity and that what they're selling is you. Um, and so it's a, and, and you, you learn there and other, and in some other places that a lot of the, these captains of techn- technology um, do the same thing with their own children. They, they limit severely uh, their, their use of social media and smart devices. I think it's telling that that would be the case. Um, but I agree with you. And I, and I think the video is wonderful. I think you're right. There's a, there's a splash of, of humor in there. A lot of really great, just, uh, imagery. Uh, and if you want to peel the onion back far enough, there's some really sort of powerful messages about becoming too slavish to our own device, um, which I liked a lot. So um, so a couple of more songs I want to talk about because this, the, this is the, uh, by the way, um, I, I saw on your website, it looks as though um, all things, I guess, remaining on track that you'll be on tour later this year. Is that uh, st- still the plan? Fingers crossed, yeah. Nobody knows 
for sure what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, there is even a possibility of doing maybe some festivals later this summer. Then there's the planned European tour in November and December this year, but nobody knows for sure. So we just have to go week by week and see what happens. Yeah. I think that's what everybody's having to do is. Yeah. It sucks, but that's the only way. I mean, um, it's I about think, time to go back, but. Yeah. I, well, I think there's optimism um, and, and hope and planning. Um, but it's, I, it's certainly true. It's fragile enough that at any moment, you know, you may have to make a, a change. Uh, but I was encouraged to see that at least for now, it's, um, there's some tentative planning going on. So that's good. Um, and I assume that uh, when you do finally get on the road, we'll, we'll hear a healthy amount of this record, the, the human nature record. Sure will. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about a couple more tracks and then we'll move on to some other of your creative life. Um, I, I think maybe my one of my favorite, if not my favorite song on the track is How's the Heart. And uh, you know what I love about it, Thomas, is um, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a, um, an obvious question that just does not seem to get asked very often. And certainly not from a progressive uh, or, a, or a symphonic metal band. Um, uh, and I like, uh, I like uh, this, this notion that you've captured um, the simple interrogative uh, of, of asking yourself and potentially asking another how they are, that, that gesture of human kindness um, can go so very far. And that's the feeling it left me with. And I wanted to, and, and I think obviously music's always a personal reaction, but I wanted to know like, where does this particular um, idea come from and how do you think about it in context of this record of, of this in its theme? Human empathy is such a powerful tool. Empathy and altruism and will to do good. And we ask each other's, our friends, constantly, hi, how are you? But how often do we really mean it? Like, hi, how are you really doing? How's the heart, so to yeah. say? So go a bit deeper and actually care and ask not only from other people but only from yourself yeah every now and then just a reminder i think it's really really healthy um there's other places there's places on the record where um lyrics talk about suffering uh, and you kind of get this idea that that um part of the human experience can be to sort of suffer in silence and it doesn't have to be that way and this the invitation with this particular song is is to be a part of alleviating that in the in the lives of I don't think and I can't remember the lyric. There's one part of the invitation that suggests to me it's not just the people you know, but it could be the stranger on the road. It's not said that way, but that's the feeling I came away with. Um, mm -hmm. The total stranger. It can be a really happy looking person, you know, on top of the world. That is the most depressed one. Yeah, I've seen I've that heard. myself a few times with terrible consequences and uh, just wish that maybe somebody would have acted sooner. Um, but it's really hard to know what people are really feeling when they put on a face. Well, and, uh, you know, the other side of that, of course, is even if you ask, not everybody feels comfortable, you know, sharing. Of course. Course. Uh, but but um, they don't even get the chance if you don't ask. So anyway, beautiful song. Um, one of the most memorable choruses for me on the record. Um, um, I want to ask, um, in whole, the, there's a lot uh, about this record uh, that speaks to the world in which we live. Um, and uh, so I noted, and I hadn't known this before, uh, but that it, it, with this creative effort, you, uh, Nightwish has partnered with the World Land Trust. Um, this has probably been discussed a little bit here and there, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about why that particular relationship um, and, you know, uh, what that what that means for you guys. Like, it, um, I know that some of the videos do a really beautiful job of, of 
showing endangered species and areas of the world that need protection. Um, but uh, help me understand how that came about and what that means for you. The band came to a point where we started to feel that uh, we can actually do some like concrete change. The band has such the following all around the world that add a little something more concrete to the art, to the music that we are doing. And World Land Trust was actually found via Sir David Attenborough. Uh, we sent him a letter asking if he wanted to come and do a bit of talking for the new album. And to my huge surprise, he actually answered about a week later with a handwritten letter. So I actually got a handwritten letter from Sir David Attenborough. I That's have cool. it framed right there on the wall. Okay. And he declined very politely, saying that this is not really a thing that I do, but good luck with your album and everything. And uh, he was one of the founders of World Land Trust. So it was actually through him that we found them met the personnel there and just felt really comfortable in doing this collaboration. Because often doing, don't get me wrong, but often many of the charities, uh, they can be a dangerous road because um, you don't always know what kind of sketchy things are going on. And also you want the art that you do, the music that Nightwish do, does to be completely timeless and separate from the mortal world, so to say. And if you are too much collaborating with different instances, I don't know if this makes any sense. It takes, in my opinion, something away from the magic of the music. But with World Land Trust, we immediately felt that this is very night wishy and when we met the people there it was like a match made in heaven so that's why it became a thing that we wanted to do yeah i know well, i think it makes sense what you're talking about um mm -hmm. there's there's one level of partnership where you know not all um not all actors in the in the charitable space are always honorable but, but more to the point, finding one that whose ethos is consonant with with Nightwish and and particularly these last couple of records, um, you know that would need to be a good a good alignment um, so that it, it was spot on exactly yeah. It's That's a it. um, and I, I'm very happy that you you've done that. Um, I read up on some of the uh, the work that um, they've done and it's really pretty amazing. For those who haven't done you know, had a chance to look at um, the World Land Trust. I, uh, it's worth your time to look at how much good they have done in the world. It sure um, is. And I, I want to emphasize that I do, and I know the other band members do a lot of uh, different kinds of charity things on their own names and sure. uh, secretly. I do that a lot as well because I think it's really important and I have the means to do it. But to connect something like Nightwish to a certain charity group has to be selected extra carefully because yeah. of the reasons I just mentioned. So I, I just don't want people to think that I think charity is bad or something like that. No. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that you gave that impression at all. Okay. Um, so um, before we move on to some other things, I saw that um, Nightwish and the record have been nominated for several Emma Awards. And there's a, I believe there's a, uh, a ceremony or, or some sort of show in May, um, but you can correct me, but it looks like it was nominated for album, uh, Human Nature was nominated for Album of the Year. You guys were nominated for Band of the Year. Uh, it was nominated for Metal Album of the Year and Viewer's Choice of the Year. Is that, yeah, is that four that categories. Right? Yes. Huh. And the gala is taking place in four weeks. It's the 14th of May and I will be attending. Yeah. It's going to be pretty strict, uh, a lot of COVID tests before and after and all that, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll congratulations. That's, um, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, thank you. 
good luck to you. I hope that uh, I hope you win one or all of them. Um, but that, that that's a really a, sort of has to be a little feel some some goodness for some recognition for the the work because I know. I know the energy that goes into writing these there you and we won't cover this again, but I know you discussed that after writing endless forms, you had to sort of refill the, this, the uh, creative coffers uh, to go again. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, you know, the, it has, it has to feel good to see, see some recognition for the work. Um, of course, not it's not the most important thing as every single musician would say, but it's still yeah. nice to get the recognition and it can, work also as an inspiring, inspiring thing. Yeah. Sure. Well, and it gives potentially gives an opportunity to also share again, the, the, um, the relationship with world land trust, you know, I think that it's all, it's all just good. I think that they can work together. Um, fun little thing here that maybe folks don't know, but I'd love to have you tell us just a little bit about is that you had an insect named after you. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh... A, a species of mosquito, a gnat, uh, yeah. that was found in Lapland, and they actually named it Schiophilia holopaineni. One of the biggest uh, compliments that I've ever received. Yeah, it, it really is. So nature. there's actually, yeah, there's actually a species named after myself. So that's quite something. That is something. Um, mm. Congratulations on that too. Do you, have you have you seen one in real life? Or? I have not. Uh, the man, the biologist who found it, sent me a photo, and okay. it's very, very rare, still. Is it was it discovered in Finland? Yeah, in Lapland, in Savukoski. Okay, that's what I think I remember. Well, that's a fun that's a fun get, thing to get to to claim. How many people are ever going to be able to say that? <laughs> um, it's just it's just incredible. I mean. And these things happened within like months, having a handwritten letter from David Attenborough and then having new species of animal named after you. Yeah. It's quite overwhelming, really. Um, well, you know, uh, I think your, your hard work and your music um, are paying interesting dividends you may not have ever anticipated. Um, I think it's great. Um, I don't really yeah. consider it work. I know what you mean, but uh, it's just creating things, writing music, telling stories. It really is a way of life, and the mind never, ever shuts up. And that has its advantages and disadvantages. Because sometimes you would like to watch a film and just enjoy it as it is without paying attention to the score all the time. Yeah. Or... I'd like to do maybe some traveling or hiking without constantly having new melodies or ideas in, rolling in my head. Yeah. So it's really hard to make, make it go away. But on the other hand, it creates new stuff all the time as well. And that's something I absolutely love. That's... I I know what you mean. in life. I know you. I mean, you are a creative person as well, so you must know how it how it feels like. You yeah, love I, it and I, sometimes hate it at the same time. Well, and it, it can um, it can alienate you at times. I, I, you know, part of my life is as a writer, and um, all day long I will disappear inside my head, and characters start to talk and and um, and get involved in scenes. And I'm not aware until I'm sort of brought back to the world around me by people uh, that love me. And it's not, I'm not intentionally trying to ignore anybody. I'm just helpless to these, what I call mind movies. And they just happen all the time. Um, and it's a blessing, but you know, there is the consequence that some people think that you're not present. Uh, mm. So I, I, I mean, it's not exactly what you described. You were describing a sort of a musical transport. But um, I, I still, thing, yeah, I understand what you're, you're describing. And to your point, getting to do something that you love so much is not the same as work, at least the way we, we colloquially talk about work. Um, it's not that it doesn't require effort, but it doesn't feel like a burden either. Um, exactly, yes. 
Let's talk yeah. about Ari a um, little bit. Uh, so we have a little bit of a touch point there because uh, Pat Rothfuss is a friend of mine. Now, I know that Ari is not um, all about um, the King Killer Chronicles, but, you know, there's a, at least a sliver of how the name came about. And some of the lyrical content alludes to the character Ari from his books. Um, On the first album, yes. And uh, we got the idea for the name, for the title of the band from his books. From his books, yeah. But, but uh, Ari is not about that, only about that. And right. uh, yeah. I have to tell you, this sounds maybe sounds odd, but when I was listening to uh, the first record, I could imagine your your wife's voice as the voice of Ari. Um, this very um, light, melodic voice. Um, I don't know well, why. She's, Ari is my wife's favorite literary character of all time. So, oh, is that right? Yeah. Um, so it was. It came really natural from her. Uh, you can tell. You can tell that uh, she inhabited that space um, authentically. Um, a question around around your musical efforts with Ari is: What sort of um, sort of itch uh, does this scratch for you? That that the, the the famous quote is is from Eddie Van Halen. He was asked, you know, about side projects, and he says, "I." I don't feel any compulsion to do a side project because every all of the musical expression that I want to do, I'm able to do in in Van Halen. But most of the, yeah. the musical artists I know yeah. aren't like that. They they do other things that are rather different. And so I'm I'm interested to know what what Ari sort of means for you um, that that is different than Nightwish. That's needful somehow. The playing field of Nightwish is so vast that um, I can do almost whatever I want with that. Almost. Mm -hmm. um, about seven years ago, I did a solo album about Scrooge McDuck. And that is just yeah. a story that you cannot do with Nightwish because it would be unfair towards the other band members who don't feel perhaps so strongly about this one character. So to actually devote a year or two to do a thematic album about a duck, uh, it's really not for Nightwish, even though we could do almost anything with it. So that had to be done on a solo name, even though I have absolutely no ambition uh, for going on a solo career at any point. So it was a one-timer. Then with Ari, it's just about this really deep connection that we have with my wife and Troy. There's something that I can't explain going on between us artistically, the way we see the world, the way we hear music, art, books, everything it's that it just felt like it would be really interesting to see what we could cook up together musically. Uh, it would be yeah. a completely different dynamic from Nightwish, which has a long history, uh, many albums, six persons. So this time it would be just the three of us, complete freedom, as in Nightwish, of course, too. But we start from scratch and see what happens. And it just felt really interesting and challenging. And it filled this little hole somewhere that needed to be filled. And even though it started as a side project, it has become more like a real band now. And we're already planning on doing a little tour at some point. We just, uh, at the end of last year, finished mixing album number two called Those We Don't Speak Of. And it will be released later this year in September. Oh, that's great. I did see that title and I was going to ask you about the second record. So September timeframe um, and potential touring in the future. That's it. That's, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. We were hoping to do it at the end of next year already, but because of the bizarreness of the world at the moment, uh, I think a lot of Nightwish shows will be postponed to 2022. So that also means that uh, the planned R tour will not happen in 2022. But at some point, it will. Well, I've been, when I was looking at the dates 
um, you have for the Nightwish tour. And I, again, acknowledging that those are tentative. Uh, my one disappointment was it doesn't look like you're coming to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at least the current lineup shows a couple of dates in Los Angeles and a, and one in New York and I think one near Boston. Um, so if that if that remains um, how it goes, I may have to see if I can make a road trip to Los Angeles. Come down and see you play I there. I think you should. Yeah. You know, Seattle was the very first show we ever did with uh, Floor. I was there. I think you were there. Yeah, I remember. Robin was there as well. Uh, uh, Megan was there. Uh, we yeah. came up and chatted with you guys. We got some pictures. Um, I remember um, we were chatting, and I guess the part of the story that Floor told us was that she had, I guess, gotten the the nod to be in the group and had about two weeks to to learn material before that night. And she had much less in. than that. Actually, it was about two to three days. Oh, okay. Um, when we called her, she was at her sister's wedding and she was on board a plane about two days later. And when she landed, she had about 20 hours before the first show. Well, I have, you know, she's such a professional. No one would ever have known that she hadn't been, hadn't known or prepared the songs for much longer than that. Um, it was an amazing show. It was such a kind of a fun honor and story to be able to be at her first show with Nightwish. Um, and then yeah, history in the making. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, well, we'll we'll watch the the schedule um, for the the tour. Maybe I can even convince Megan to do a, a road trip, and we'll come down and and. Uh, it see would it. be so wonderful to see you too. So yeah. please make it happen. Yeah, well, uh, I think that would be so much fun. Hopefully, all of the on our side, um, the restrictions are. Are, have lifted by then as well mm -hmm. um i think they will have if you guys are able to tour um i want to talk a minute about um the music inspired by the life and times of scrooge um is it wh what was the impetus to do something around that character had you read the the comics was it something about the scrooge story itself from dickens i I grew up with Disney. I learned to read from a Finnish Donald Duck magazine when I was like two and a half years old. And these okay. characters are such a massive part of my childhood, especially the ducks and out of the ducks, especially Scrooge McDuck. Okay. And then when Don Rosa wrote his masterpiece, uh, The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck, uh, just changed so much. I, th I still think it's, top five best fictional stories ever written with so much humor and insight and wit and life lessons that I just had to get it out of my head and show the world like, you know, listen to this, look at this story. I mean, that's music is where I can yell at the world, check this story out. Uh -huh. Isn't it incredible? So just needed to get it out of my head. That was, there was the original of, inspiration for it. Uh, was there any sort of challenge with Disney, like from a brand perspective? Well, you couldn't use the actual title of the book. That's why it's music inspired by the life and times of Scrooge, not MacDuck. Then in the cover artwork, you couldn't show his face. So Scrooge is portrayed from behind. All these little things like that. But... Uh, in the end, the process was pretty smooth. It's a beautiful record. Um, I, I remember when it came out and listening to part of it. Uh, but over the last month, I've listened to it through a few times. Um, I think it deserves a lot more um, awareness. Um, so hopefully this will help uh, some people come to it. It, it le leads me to a question, though. Um, my, my notes show that it was you worked with the London Philharmonic Orchestra on that. Is, is that accurate? Yes, it's the same orchestra that we have been using since the Once album. So on every single Nightwish album and on the Scrooge album, we have used the same orchestra. So the, the question I have is when you're composing uh, and you know that you've got an orchestra that you're writing for, does it 
does it change how you um, compose the music versus if, if or before you knew that you had an orchestra that was going to be playing the music? Whenever I write music, I always think of the personnel who's going to be performing this song. So naturally, I hear the voices of the vocalists in my head. When I know that there's an orchestra and a choir to be used, of course, I hear those elements in there as well. And the way that I approach the use of the orchestra is like, this is the best sounding keyboard in the world that I would be playing if I had 20 hands. Okay. So the orchestra really needs to be part of the song and not just on top of everything for curiosity's sake. It needs to complement the music and the story blend in. Yeah. Um, your, your, your writing style is, um, and it's not just because of the orchestral component, but it's, it has a very cinematic quality to it, to me. Um, and I know that you, you, you um, sort of co-wrote uh, the score to Imaginarum. Uh, uh, by the way, you and I have a, an interesting tie there um, in that uh, Petri Alanko, who did, um, who co-wrote that with you, did the music for the cut scenes on Alan Wake. And Alan Wake was, was put out by my company that I used to work for at Xbox. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, That's the connection I, there. Interesting. Okay. I remember um, the, 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 the game did not perform as well as the company had hoped, but it had, you know, it was a, it was a narrative driven um, sort of crime, dark crime thing and uh it had wonderful wonderful music they actually did some product packaging around the music itself because it was so well done okay. so um yeah i i read that this morning and i thought wow that's a really neat uh connection and, and but it, but the larger question is because and i'm not the only one who feels this way your music has this cinematic quality is is film scoring something that you ever have an itch to do as a as a bespoke effort uh, not not necessarily something yeah. related to your own story, but if you know, just film scoring. It's one of those big, big unfulfilled dreams to be able to do a score, because already in, I think the term that you used was mind movies. Yeah, yeah. The same with me. Whenever I get an idea for a song, I immediately see it as a short film that starts from here and ends here. Yeah. And then you just try to paint the story alive with music in the best possible way. And you just consider all the possible options. Is this a ballad? The, uh, is this a really hard pounding heavy metal song? Could we use some new elements here? Would bringing in the choir into this part enhance that part of the story? All this stuff takes ages, and it's the process that I love the most by far in, yeah. in music. So that's how I all, uh, create music for Nightwish. And to be able at some point to do an actual score for an inspiring film would just be incredible. However, um, I take my music very seriously and I always have a really clear vision of the end result. And when it comes to movie business, I already saw this with the, the making of the film Imaginarum. Um, the one who does the music doesn't have really much to say in the end. So I'm just afraid that I might have a bit overly romantic image of the whole industry. Yeah. And uh, even though the story or the film in the making would inspire me immensely and I would come up with all these songs and melodies, then they would be installed into the film in a way that would not be satisfactory to me as an artist. Maybe, I don't know. So, yeah. But still, films, film music, they are such a big part of my life, my inspiration, what I am, that it would be nice to give it a try at some point. Do you have any favorite film composers? There are a few. Uh, James Newton Howard, Hans Zimmer, uh, Danny Elfman, John Williams. 
Trevor Jones, um, Van Gelis, of course, he's done a couple of films. Uh, just to mention a few. Yeah. Um, I like, I like uh, many of those. My very favorite personal uh, film composer is Thomas Newman. Um, oh, I was going to say Thomas Newman. He did the Shawshank Redemption, didn't he? Did. Yeah, yeah his, he's incredible. It's really long, but um, after that film, I can't count the number of TV shows and other films that have replicated certain um, instrument combinations for certain mood setting that hmm. uh, he essentially pioneered. Um, big fan of his. Um, he also, by the way, did um, Tolkien. So he's he's done some very sort of fanciful. He did Tolkien. Oh yeah, that's right. He did. Excellent. Yeah. And also, <laughs> Hans Zimmer is a pioneer in a way that he actually made string in instruments into percussive elements, and that's yeah. something that's never been heard before, at least that's in right. that scale. That's exactly right. Yeah, mm. a very signature thing for him. Yeah. Um, on the topic of story, uh, you had you had made a. I think it was in a. Uh, an interview years ago, uh, sort of a statement that you were in the process of maybe writing a book of short stories. And I, I know that you've done some writing. I wondered where, where that may sit in your creative efforts. I was writing a lot last year. Uh, I have 12 stories now. But uh, then a lot of things started to happen at the end of last year, in the beginning yeah. of this year. And I noticed that um, when shit hits the fan, I cannot concentrate in writing, but I can do music. And I have no idea what's going on there. Escaping the bad feelings into music feels natural, but I just couldn't write at all anymore. So when it comes to writing fiction, I seem to need this at least a certain amount of serenity and good mood to be able to do that and since the last few months without going into details haven't been the best <laughs> um, i haven't been able to write anything for months but it's but still it's something that i want to finish at some point good well, I, um, I, I got a peek at a little, little parts of that. And um, I'm excited for the day when you're able to finish uh, your, your book of stories and, and have an English trans translation. Yeah. Um, I, I understand you're a bit of a horror film fan. Um, I, I want to commit. So do you, read, do you read any horror fiction as a reader? Not that much, actually. I've never read a single Lovecraft book, for example, but I've read all the Stephen King novels. That's what I, 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 I remember yeah. that you're a Stephen King fan. Yeah. Um, and there, there are allusions in your music to Ray Bradbury. Have you ever read Bradbury? With the, I haven't like actually, no. Comes. Something Wicked This Way comes. I've read that, yeah. But that's the yeah. only book I've read. I think, you know, not that you have tons of spare time, but he's he's maybe the most lyrical writer of science fiction and fantasy that the genres ever had. What I um, remember reading from that book is that it took me like two weeks to read it because yeah. the way he writes is so complex and beautiful that it, as a non-native English speaking person, I had to read every sentence at least twice to get it. But it was still beautiful, but it was a very slow read. Yeah, he, he, um, he's one of those who advocates that writers spend a lot of time reading poetry uh, to mm -hmm. become good writers as a way of efficiency and, and uh, creating metaphor. Um, uh, if you ever get around to reading another um, more Stephen King uh, style horror book, um, Dan Simmons uh, Stephen King actually is, gives him huge props. He's my favorite writer. Dan uh, Simmons, I've read The Terror. Oh, have you? Read it okay. Yes, I read it. You know Dan. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he's, um, he's, I think he's a national treasure, and he's just not, mm. uh, hasn't had the, the uh, altitude of career, obviously, that King has. Um, well, we're close to time here. Um, 
I wanted to um, ask you kind of in, in closing, I mean, we've, we've explored obviously Nightwish and some of the big thematic questions that you tackle. We've explored um, Ari, um, talked about your solo work. We've talked about um, some of your other creative dabblings, but is there, um, is there some other creative thing that you know you want to, to do at some point? Um, we've, and we've talked about maybe you would like to score if that worked out, but is there some hidden creative bent that you just haven't had time to explore, but like you just, you know, is somehow need, you need to get it out? Well, um, we have been creating crossword puzzles for a few years now for different Finnish magazines with my wife. Oh, wow. So that's something that I really enjoy. It clears my head and just, I I love words and playing with them. So doing crossword puzzles, coming up with clues to solve them. It's a lot of fun. So that's what we have been doing for a while now. But there is one creative ambition besides scoring a film that I have. And that's coming up with a game, creating a new game, oh. a board game or a deck building game or something like that. Because I'm a massive board game fan. Okay. We play we play every week like Carcassonne, Agricola, uh, Dominion, all the classics, even chess. And so, what an idea it would be to come up with your own board game. So that's have, in the list of my things that I want to do before I die. That would be really fascinating. I've got um, a lot of friends. Uh, I go to Comic Con most every year. And I have lots of friends in the gaming industry who are game publishers and game designers. Um, so, you, and you may have your own contacts, but if you ever decide to really get serious there, I can put you in touch with people who do game development and game publishing. Um, well, thank you. Much appreciated. I just need the idea for the game first. I have an absolutely yeah. no idea, but it's in the back of my mind constantly. It'll come. It'll come. Yeah. And, you know, I think everybody probably listening to this is, would be happy if you just continue to write Nightwish records. Um, but I'm, I'm happy that you have so many varied creative interests. Um, and I wanted to spend some time talking to you to show people the dimensions of who you are as an artist, um, you know, because I think it, I'm, I'm hoping that as people learn more about your music and the things you do, that we, we can become increasingly receptive to um, you know, musical expressions. Like, I, there's a whole bunch of people, I think, who would share a lot of your passion for the ideas that you're um, expressing in some of this music who aren't aware of it. And um, from my corner of the world, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to share it with them uh, because I think it, not just from a, a commerce perspective, because it's another album sale, because I think that people, you know, who have, are of a like mind um, enjoy sharing those things. Um, and, you know, not that I, not that I know that you'll always be writing these kinds of records, but at least over the last several years, they've had, they've, they've tackled these big themes. Um, and I commend you for it. Um, thank you, sir. So the, I will just in parting say, uh, everybody be sure to take a look for Nightwish's uh, special engagement, which is an evening with Nightwish in a virtual world. Um, watch out for this next teaser that's coming. It sounds like it's going to be um, some mix of virtual world and and um, live performance. Um, I can't wait. I'm going to go grab my ticket uh, uh, and I'll be there with you virtually. <laughs> thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. All right, Thomas, we have a, a great evening and thanks so much for joining us today. It was a lovely chat. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, my friend. You too. Bye-bye for now. Bye.